evening, everyone. We start this session on, you know, cell and gene therapy. And I take this opportunity to, uh, first of all, thank the VRSI, Dr. Mahesh, and the entire you know, team of uh, uh, VRSI at Nagpur. Um, I would first like to introduce, of course, we know people on the um, uh, dais, Dr. Uh, Gopal, Dr. Mayang Bansal, Dr. Purna, and Dr. Deepika. But more importantly, I would like to introduce the two people on the screen, Dr. Rajiv Muni and Dr. Ajoy Vincent. Um, Dr. Rajiv Muni and Dr. Ajoy Vincent are consultants at uh, Sick Kids Toronto. And uh, Dr. Rajiv Muni is a VR surgeon, while Dr. Ajoy Vincent is a faculty with uh, retinal dystrophies. Uh, Ajoy is also a very dear friend. And uh, I'm really glad to have the two of them you know, on the uh, panel here. So uh, we're going to start with my talk. So And we have this. Oh, I need to come to the other program. It is showing optogenetic, guys. Can I see that here? What is coming? They just take. Okay. Cell and gene therapy, where are we? Um, I'm going to just quickly talk about gene therapy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because both Dr. Ajeev and uh, you know, Dr. Ajoy are going to spend a lot of time on Luxterna. So, uh, sorry. Okay, something happened then. Okay, maybe I'll just use it. Uh, Several diseases, you know, even to this day and age, AMD, you know, uh, advanced dry AMD, but some, you know, quite a bit of wet AMD, retinal dystrophies have no treatment. And uh, the burden of both these diseases is quite large. If you look at dry AMD and, you know, uh, uh, RP, just with retinal pigmentosa, we have more than, you know, uh, uh, close to 2 million people in India, while with AMD, it's a much larger disease with nearly 25 million people with AMD in India. So, what is it that, you know, what research has been happening in both these areas? While the research in terms of gene-specific treatments would be gene therapy, of course, while the mutation-independent approaches would either be cell replacement therapy, you know, retinal processes, uh, neuroprotective factors like CNTF and so on. So quickly to look at why is the ISO, you know, useful for uh, gene therapy and cell therapy? Why is it that the eye is a target? So one is, of course, we have two eyes, we can use the other eye as contralateral, uh, you know, uh, control relatively immunoprivileged and we have a significant number of imaging modalities to understand what, you know what we are doing and we also have quite a few animal models for these you know uh, diseases so what is gene therapy if you look at it this is the, uh, uh, the rod and the rpe and the, uh, the the outer segment of the rods and cones and the um, uh, rpe most of the mutations that cause retinal dystrophies cause a mutation in one of these parts of the visual cycle. So if you, if you look at autosomal recessive diseases, you need to replace a gene that is defective, so it's gene replacement therapy, whereas in autosomal dominant function, you not only need to replace, but you also need to take away the abnormal proteins that is there, so it's gene silencing. Either way, vectors play a key role. We have several vectors currently, it has been you know, studied for for, uh, almost a couple of decades, adenovirus, adeno-associated virus, lentiviral, nanoparticles, and so on. Again, easier way of delivery, intravitreal versus subretinal. Several clinical trials are happening around the world. Really a lot of animal trials, while 2017 was a landmark era for, you know, uh, ophthalmology, when uh, gene therapy for uh, biallelic mutations in RP65 was uh, approved by the US FDA. And uh, so we'll have the next two speakers speak about this. There are several clinical trials for phase one, phase one and two in, uh, you know, in star guard, ichromatopsia, all of that. So I think it's a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, positive, uh, you know, future to look forward that there are many of these clinical trials on the um, anvil. There are, of course, other therapies, including, you know, MRN therapies and, you know, so on. In fact, we're going to hear a bit about CRISPR from Dr. Mayank. Lot of challenges, of course. We don't know much about these diseases. Can we give it once? Are there antibodies that are going to be formed? What is the long-term effect? Most importantly, very expensive. 
Laxterna in the US and the Western world is about $450,000 per injection for a point, you know, 3 ml. So uh, definitely not something that uh, Indians can afford easily. So cell-based therapy. I'll spend the next four minutes on cell-based therapy. And uh, I'll basically talk about, you know, uh, our journey at iSTEM. We started iSTEM about um, five years ago, 2017. And I'll take you through the journey of iSTEM. So what is cell-based therapy? You can either inject ocular or non-ocular derived stem cells. And uh, a lot of people were working on embryonic stem cells earlier. This was obtained from the uh, blastocyst of an embryo. And um, in 2008, Professor Shinya Yamanaka showed that you could actually take out a you know, piece of uh, skin or peripheral blood and convert them into uh, you know, uh, pluripotent stem cells. But he got the Nobel for that. So those are called the induced pluripotent stem cells. And what have we done? So you can, you know, we've taken all blood from you know, uh, the, the peripheral blood, created PBMCs. And so this is the de novo gen uh, 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 generation of cells from iPSC. Take PBMC, you create iPSC, then you take them through a series of experiments in vitro, convert them from the iPSC into the uh, RPE cells. So there are several uh, uh, ways, uh, you know, uh, of uh, doing this. It, so there are specific targets we give in, you know. Uh, uh, so this is the eventual RP cells that we see in a very uh, dense um, uh, cluster, the hexagonal that we cells that we see. So once we've seen that, we need to know that these are indeed RP cells. So there's a lot of uh, immunohistochemistry that's done. We do the, you know, show that they are indeed from a neuroectonomal lineage. We then show that they are from, you know, uh, uh, optic cycle markers. And then you have to show that these are indeed RP cells and not something else. So I'm not going to go into so many of those details. You purify these by uh, a flow cytometry and you actually run an entire transcriptomics on it to understand that, you know, uh, the uh, configuration of these cells. And we've also shown that these RP cells are not just um, sitting there as cells, but they also, uh, you know, uh, producing um, uh, whatever need, whatever the RP is, 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 say it's functional. So this is how the RP cells looks in a append of tube. So this is a cell that contains about 5 million tubes, uh, 5 million cells. And so how it works in here is once we've done all the in vitro studies, we now have to go into the animal models. So um, the RCS rat is what we looked as the um, model for, you know, um, uh, our uh, studies. It, it, this is a good model because it's got a multi k gene. So it's, you know, a good model both for RP and AMD. And we did several studies. Um, we've actually done till now about three different trials to show that one, it is safe and efficacious. So these are subretinal transplantation done in the uh, rat, uh, rat eyes. So then you test them functionally. You also do a histology subsequently. And uh, we've had very good results. Um, so it is shown that based on erythroretinograms and optokinetic you know, thresholds, we've shown that animals that would have otherwise gone blind can see up to three months following these RPE cell injections. So uh, those are all the different you know, uh, studies that we did. So before we go forward, we need to know that what we are doing is really worthwhile taking forward. So we've done a lot of steps to achieve that. One of the most important, you know, what looks structurally visible to us is look at the outer nuclear layer. So if I have a magnified view. Okay, so this is a saline injected animal and that's a cell injected. So the outer nuclear layer is considered as a surrogate marker for these. So if you look at the saline injected, see how disintegrated that you know, layer is compared to this where you inject the cells and you know, it's a uh, pretty good layer. So what is the, now that we've done all our you know, animal studies, what is the roadmap? We have to conduct you know, tumor studies to show that these cells do not cause any tumors. We've done that. We've also done studies to show that it's not toxic. That means we have to give, you know, a multiple times the dose that we use and show that it's not toxic. Those are done. What we also did was to, so this is, in fact, some of those, you know, uh, animals you know, uh, uh, where we did an OCT post-injection in the uh, uh, rat eye. And we also did um, an NHP experiment at SERI. Uh, we have a collaboration with Singapore Eye Research Institute where we tried to, uh, doing uh, experiments uh, in the NHP in, in non-human primate macaque monkeys to see what is it that we can understand for surgical delivery of these cells. In fact, I'm going to take the liberty of saying that 
uh, Professor Lingam Gopal was the one who did these surgeries. And uh, so you create a subretinal bleb. And we could show that, uh, you know, OCT showed that the bleb was pretty well formed. This is a very, very recently done, you know, surgery. So we don't have a lot of follow up on this. And uh, so once we have had all of this, we now go to the uh, uh, DCGI with, uh, you know, uh, to ask approvals for an IND or the investigational new drug. Once that happens, then uh, we, we plan to start our clinical trials um, in India. This is, of course, like I said, going to be for dry AMD. So we also have the next bit of, you know, photoreceptors. Uh, we've done a lot of work on that. I'm not going to talk much about it for want of time. So for now, we're going to concentrate on the um, uh, RPE. Of course, even with the photoreceptors, there's a lot of, you know, uh, clinical trials, nothing as yet in phase one, two. A lot of these are all, uh, you know, in vitro experiments. I want to show one other uh, uh, company that has been working on RPE. Uh, it is called Lineage Therapeutics, started off as an Israeli company, is now incorporated in the US. And they have shown that a significant amount of visual recovery, I think about 15 to uh, 24 letters is what they showed, their you know, cohorts following RPE suspension. So that is the recovery that they showed of uh, you know, uh, um, the ellipsoid zone following the RPE injection. And, um, there is another clinical trial that's happening in Japan where, you know, they're using scaffolds. So this is definitely an evolving field. This is, there's no final answer for this. And uh, uh, all of our, these patients are older, but they need immunosuppression. But what we see in the, you know, animals, which is going to translate to humans, all of these are questions. And there's always a debate that's going to be of a sheet versus, you know, cells. And the difficulties of injecting these cells. So that's where we are. That's where our lab is, you know, incorporated in, you know, C-CAMP. And that's my team. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can we? Can we then invite Dr. Ajoy Vincent? He's going to share his experience with Luxterna. Ajoy, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, Ajoy. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll be sharing our experience of uh, three cases we had in Canada. If I can get to. So Luxterna was approved by Health Canada in late 2020 for patients who had bioelectric mutations in RB65 and viable retinal cells. They approved it for an age range between 4 and 65 years. This primarily came from the clinical trial data. And for patients who had vision 2060 or worse and who have fields less than 20 degrees in any meridian for a 3 4 equal months. We have treated three patients to date. This is because we only have been able to get approvals on the private side. We are still awaiting ministry funding for the rest of the 20 patients whom we can treat hopefully in the next couple of years. I'm just going to share you some pre-op pearls and monitoring protocol. Uh, uh, we use best corrected visual equity with lab, intraocular pressure, fundus evaluation, and OCT, Goldman visual fields to monitor patients, a special test, uh, which is quite simple to do, known as the full field stimulus test, is commonly used to monitor the effect of gene therapy. This is a test which, which enables us to see what is the minimum amount of light the patient can see, and the results of which were shown in clinical trial to mirror the mobility test. So this is one test which can be done in post-clinical trial or patient care era where we are in now. Next is, it's very important of, uh, to counsel the patient and manage expect expectation pre-op. Although, you know, this is a gene therapy, it is important to say that this is a rescue operation, not a restoration procedure. And treatment planning. So we do extensive planning with our retina colleagues. So based on the fields and OCT, we pre-op, we plan where the injection would be delivered. 
And then uh, we, about three days prior, we start about one milligram per kilogram per, kilogram per day of uh, prednisolone tablet. Let's go to the cases. Case one is a 24-year-old male with bilirubin mutations in RP65. Baseline vision was 21,000 and 2,800 in the right and left eyes, respectively. As you can see from the fundus image, there is macular atrophy and considerable amount of uh, RPE changes in the periphery. OCT also confirms that there is significant loss of outer retinal layers, but there is still some identifiable uh, outer nuclear layer uh, despite the remodeling. This is the pre-op visual fields. This is to a 5-4-E target. There is a small, tiny central island and an infrotemporal island in both eyes. We treated the right eye first, and for the left eye, when we this, uh, we plan to give a central injection within the arcade and also a peripheral injection to target the island which is seen in the periphery. So this island in the periphery. <clears throat> So right eye was treated first, as Dr. Patu said, 0.3 milliliters of, which contains 1.5 to 10 to the order of 11 vectograms per eye was injected into the eye. Uh, the subretinal uh, injections are pretty, absorbed pretty fast. These are OCTs from day five. Uh, on post of day five, vision was light perception in either eye with minimal anterior chamber inflammation. Steroids and antibiotics were stopped within two to three following surgery of the second eye. At six weeks, the visual equity was 2,800 and 21,000. And at six months, it was 2,800 and 21,000. So the pre-op, uh, as you remember, it was 21,000 and 2,800 in the right and left eyes respectively. And these are the fields, uh, fields at six weeks post-op. As you can appreciably see, uh, we don't see a sensitivity to the large target at the center, but we still see retention of the peripheral islands. And this is the full field stimulus test. The air, black arrow that you see at the top is the timing of the surgery. As you can see here, uh, uh, and uh, for the sake of time, I'll be just focusing on this black trace here, which is the full field stimulus to a white stimulus. As you can see here, Pre-op, the patient could not could only see a stimulus which was about minus five decibel intensity. Whereas at six weeks and six months post-op, you can the patient is able to see much dimmer stimulus of light, saying showing that you know the patient's retinal sensitivity has improved. And now let's look at the left eye. The storyline is similar. As you can see here, the left eye showed more improvement. Uh, uh, over time, and the patient could actually see about one more than 100 times dimmer light follow-up visits. It took about three to four weeks for the patients to show any sub subjective improvement. Uh, the patient said that at night, as he was looking out, uh, he could see things in the balcony, and at six weeks, he was able to see outline of patients, uh, including uh, street lights and including the edge of the Sidewalk. At six months, his peripheral vision seemed improved and central for him. Central vision, he said, that may have gotten worse, slightly worse post surgery. Case two uh, is a 13 year old male. The vision is 2063 in either eye. And as you can see, you know, there is still some residual ellipsoid zone uh, within the macula. The fundus again shows uh, evidence of RB changes in the periphery. The disc looks crowded. Uh, and this is, I just want to say a word about fundus autofluorescence. Uh, there is no residual autofluorescence in cases of RP65 related retinal dystrophy. Uh, this can be used as an early screening tool because only in vitamin A recycling disorders you would see loss of RP, loss of fundus autofluorescence. So this can be a cheap test which can be done in the clinic. And here are the fields. Uh, this child has, uh, had a better field, so there were small uh, fields to a 1-4-E, and then 
to a tree for e, there was mid peripheral and peripheral scotomas. The scotomas were more dense in the left eye, and hence the left eye was treated first, uh, followed by the right eye. This is uh, uh, post op day five. Again, the subretinal blep resolved uh, very fast. Uh, even on the first post op day, we could not actually see the subretinal blep. Uh, the vision was 21, 25, and 2300. Uh, with minimal AC inflammation. This patient was a steroid responder, so we had to um, give a dorsalamide com combination for about uh, two to three weeks until we, the patient was on steroids. Six weeks post up, the vision improved to 2080 and 2100. At three months, the vision was at 2080, both eyes. And these are the fields. As you can see here, uh, there is some gain of peripheral fields, whereas there is some uh, loss in some other areas, uh, but in general, as you can see here from the full field stimulus test, there is way better sensitive retina. So from pre-op to post-op, the patient could actually see more than 100 times dimmer light, be it white, red, or blue. This is case three, who is the twin sibling of case two. His vision was 2050 and 2080 in the right and left eye respectively. Again, you can see some residual preservation of the outer retinal layers. Fundus pictures are similar. And here again, as you see in the autofluorescence, there is hardly any uh, autofluorescence that is noticeable. These are his fields. Again, uh, you see a small field in the center to a 14E and 3 e target and large islands. Uh, uh, in the periphery. Again, we treated the left eye followed by the right eye, and these are uh, five day post op OCTs, where it, at, his, at which time his vision was 2200 in either eye. Uh, his vision improved to 2063 and 20, pardon me, in either eye at six weeks post op. And, 20, and it further improved to 2040 and 2063 at the most recent week. And these are his fields. Again, no noticeable improvement um, in the left eye and perhaps some areas of new scotomas in the right eye. But again, the most striking improvement is in the full field stimulus threshold. As you can see here, there is, you could see about 15 times dimmer white light, red light, and blue light with diffuse stimulus. Uh, for cases two and three, they were not good uh, historians as they are teenagers, but one striking thing the mom said was uh, previously prior to the surgery, whenever they went to the movies, uh, during uh, if they had to use the washroom, they always had to be escorted. But two or three weeks following the surgery, one day when they were at the movies, they would just run out the washroom as they could see very well. Uh, they feel that the fields are improved during night. So here is the summary. So it's the first approved gene therapy. It's a very good era for inherit inherited retinal dystrophy as a whole. Highest impact is an improvement of night vision and mobility. The FST is an imp important test to document and monitor visual field sensitivity improvement. Central vision and fields, as you saw from our results, may not necessarily improve and perhaps even slightly worsen. Most of uh, inflammation is minimal and very well manageable. And most importantly, it's uh, we should manage patient expectations. And I would like to acknowledge the huge team at SickKids, uh, our retinal surgeons, including Dr. Muni and our fellows, and the entire oculogenetic team at SickKids. Uh, and I would be happy to take any question. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. That was a wonderful, man. I'm going to start with our panel. Yes, sir. Much more than giving any comments, I would like to ask a few questions. I uh, just want to ask, what was the size of the blob that was created, injected the uh, gene, in both in the center and in the periphery? And what was the location of the blob? In other words, the atrophic area, how did you induce the blob? Did you induce next to the atrophic area? How did you choose where you're likely to get a blob without the retina not uh, allowing it to be lifted up? 
and yeah. the uh, sir, can i interrupt sir uh, dr raji muni who is the next one he has got a talk on the right, surgery right, yeah. uh, okay in which case let him finish Let's his finish the okay. yeah we'll go ahead dr rajiv's uh, talk then we'll take questions at the end of that session Okay, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for the very kind invitation. Uh, I just wanted to say that this was my first case here of um, Luxternite treatment, um, and I'm a vitreo retinal surgeon, uh, and we worked in collaboration with uh, Ajoy and Dr. Aon, and um, this was uh, our first uh, case. And so uh, I do pediatric retinal surgery, but uh, this was our, um, uh, interesting uh, scenario here. So we start with our routine three-port uh, pars plana vitrectomy. Um, we put in our, our cannulas in the usual manner. Um, and uh, initially we start uh, with the vitrectomy. You can notice the, the pallor of the optic nerve, the attenuated vessels. Uh, and we're here starting with the core and uh, peripheral vitrectomy that you'll see here in a um, you know, as with all pediatric retina, the hardest challenge is removing the vitreous. This was probably what we were uh, uh, concerned about the most, and, um, you know, especially with the younger uh, children that we've subsequently done. And uh, this is showing you um, how we went about doing that. You know, I like to use uh, triamcinolone always to assist with uh, posterior hyaloid uh, separation, especially in children, but even in adults, I, I use it routinely in every case. And you could see that the cortical hyaloid was uh, fairly plastered onto the retina. You know, fortunately, it wasn't very thick, uh, which, you know, it, it makes it more difficult to grab onto. So usually in children, it's adherent, but it's, it's very thick, the vitreous. And uh, so you can grasp a lot in the cutter uh, and, and then be able to pull and cause some separation. Be because it was quite thin, it was hard to purchase uh, a lot of it. And so then I put in more Kenalog, and then finally I found an area uh, where it was slightly lifted. Probably there was some vitreoschisis there. And then once, uh, once that was done, the rest of the case um, from the vitrectomy perspective was very straightforward. Um, uh, so... No, I was careful not to lift the hyaloid too much. Uh, once I detached it, I, I brought it up, you know, maybe ha halfway. I didn't want to cause any traction in the periphery. We all know that causing tears in young patients is is, uh, is usually a recipe for failure. Um, so once you have it lifted off, then allow the infusion to uh, dissect off the rest as you're removing the vitreous uh, carefully. I then looked in the periphery at 360 degrees with scleral depression. We found some sort of uh, vitreoretinal tuft or tag uh, in one location. I think you'll see here. And, and then we ended up uh, doing uh, just a small laser here. Again, we're very careful. We didn't want to um, have any complication or any issue. So we, we applied a laser around that, that uh, adhesion or uh, that tag that was present. Um, so now we're going to... Uh, we'll talk. I have a little video just showing how we drew up the medication. I'll show you after. But there are two sites. So Ajoy and I planned this case. The first one for the central region, we just went just within the superior arcade here. And here you can see the subretinal uh, delivery. Uh, and I, we are careful that we don't want to inject too rapidly and we don't want to really go through the, the phobia too much and because we don't want to induce a macular hole. That was a, a preoperative a concern that we wanted to be careful about. Uh, and then uh, a joy based on the visual field he had shown you showed that there was an island of vision that was left uh, infrotemporally. So here you can see us going supranasally. Now the amount of fluid um, uh, or uh, the amount of uh, AAV vector that we're in injecting is 0 0.2 in about each blub. So you, you know the amount uh, that they recommend is 0 0.3 uh, but we decided to give 0 0.2 in, in the two locations, one for the central region, one for the peripheral region. Uh, then you're seeing the air fluid exchange being performed here. 
uh, and you can see that the fluid will migrate posteriorly, uh, which it'll then gently go into the fovea um, uh, or, you know, close to it. And, you know, from our discussions, we, we uh, and with others who have done this before us, you know, the decision is that you don't really need to go right into the fovea. Um, I'm just going to share again a, a video showing the draw up of the medication, which is probably the most stressful thing. I, I think Dr. Uh, Rajni said that it was $40,000 in India. Is that right for one treatment? No, no, no. We don't have an approval yet, uh, uh, Rajiv. Oh, okay. Do you, have, the yeah. price point in Canada is 800000 almost $1 million. <laughs> Um, so, you know, when we're uh, handling this medication, that was probably what I was most nervous about is somehow dropping it or, or you know, causing a problem. So we use a micro injector here. And so basically we're using the viscous fluid extraction with a micro injector, not the same one that we use for silicone oil, but similar, but a smaller uh, uh, one cc syringe. And here you see, I'm here on the left and we're on the viscous fluid extraction setting. And of course, I'm trying to maintain sterility. This is Dr. Hian here who's holding the, the medication. The medication was prepared three hours to give them a, you know, a window um, so that the medication can be used within three, three hours, basically. And here, um, as she was kind of injecting it a little bit, I used a 25 gauge needle on this micro injector to then aspirate it from the hub of the syringe directly. And so that maintained sterility of the, of the preparation um, and allowed us to withdraw the medication uh, safely. Um, when we inject the medication, we had a uh, viscous fluid injection setting it was about 13 millimeters of mercury. Uh, so that was worked very well. Uh, on it just dripping out before it's a constant stream. Uh, because you don't want to inject under the retina with high pressure because again we don't want to create a macular hole um, so that that's the end of my video and um, uh, I, I think Ajoy and I are happy to take any questions about the surgical procedure or about the the medical side thank you so much Rajiv that was wonderful I think I'm going to start doctor you know start. so Lingam Gopal wanted to uh, ask a question uh, Rajiv so I, I think those two questions which I wanted to ask, you already answered that, but I don't understand why visual field should go down actually, while the FST should become better. But is that considered as an overall improvement or worsening or status quo situation? How do you evaluate the final outcome of your treatment? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I can take this. So, so FST is a test which measures the retinal sensitivity as a whole. So even if there is a small improvement in peripheral retinal fields, uh, it will detect a very significant improvement functionally. So even if you get, I mean, in this instance, especially for case one, uh, I'm, I think that's what you're alluding to. Although the central visual vision has gone down as has the central fields, although we tried to avoid directly injecting at the fovea and discharging the fovea. Uh, the peripheral fields is what has improved the sensitivity of the peripheral fields. So when we ask the patients, um, in all three cases, their mobility improved drastically under mesopic and scotopic conditions. And they would take that any time of the day. So if you look at uh, real world data, uh, case one was pretty advanced and probably not the right case to start with because there was already macular atrophy to start. And these are the cases where, as far as we know, there is increased risk of further loss of central vision. But as the other two patients, the younger ones, the central vision was largely maintained and their functional vision using the re remaining retina improved drastically. So overall, even the first patient had dropped central visual equity is much more functionally uh, uh, functionally active and he is satisfied. So uh, even in- I, Ajoy, can I just yeah. comment on, on that first patient also? I, I One uh, yes. thing that was striking was that he said that 
if he was in his kitchen and he dropped a knife before he would have to use his hands to find the knife. And he said that now if he drops something on the floor, he can see where it is and pick it up. Uh, so these are the types of things we're hearing uh, from patients. And, uh, you know, it, it's a very subjective thing that we don't have proper ways of measuring. Yeah, I think Dr. Mayang wanted to go ahead, Mayang. Second question is, Sorry, go ahead, what if you drop gene, who pays for it? They, they, so, I, I believe they give us a backup syringe, you know, and so, of course, thinking about that, you know, we start to think, well, why don't we, if we don't drop it, why don't we book another patient <laughs> who doesn't have the money and uh, we can do it. But now the company is kind of not, not in favor of that approach. So, um, you know, they, they give you much more than you need. And I, I'm sure you, you, you guys will figure out a way to get more out of one dose. But, you know, I think that um, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's a great treatment. You know, I'm sure billions of dollars have been spent on, on this technology. And, and that probably justifies some of the high price at the moment. But we're all hoping that the price will, co will come down as, as the technology uh, you know, advances and, and things become cheaper and uh, to produce. So, but yes, that, that's the main thing as the surgeon, for sure. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so I gathered that uh, Luxtana is covered under the Canadian insurance scheme, right? The patients don't have to pay for it. Actually, no. At, at this moment, uh, Joy might know the more recent, but uh, basically the, um, uh, it's been, uh, covered by private insurance companies. So the, okay. the three patients that have been covered so far have been uh, private insurance. One was, I believe, Microsoft paid for it for their employee. The second one, uh, two were from the union of the, the father. Uh, they, they insisted with the insurance company because the union threatened to leave the insurance. So it was difficult. It is not easy to get this. And Ajoy, do you want to give an update on the most, yeah. most recent uh, government? Uh, Sure. So, Reese, so each province has to negotiate separately with the company, um, uh, Novartis, for a price point and agreement. Uh, as of last week, the province of Quebec, it is approved, so the ministry will pay for it within the province of Quebec. Uh, mm. So, they are, uh, uh, and our province and other provinces are following. So, it will be a matter of time. In the next few months, we hope to have uh, patients uh, coming through the a system where the ministry completely pays for it. So that is why, despite this being approved in 2020, late 2020, we still have only treated three patients uh, who have access to private insurance. Uh, but we have other 20 patients uh, we'll be getting to once we get a ministry funding for it. And one other comment I can say is in the setup, you know, it's not like any retinal surgeon can inject this medication. Like we have very specific uh, centers that have been trained uh, from the pharmacy to the nursing staff. Uh, the, uh, the company spent incredible amount of time training the entire team. And, uh, and now, so we have centers in each province or, you know, in some of the provinces that are uh, being trained to do it and, and to manage it because you know, as a public payer system, they, um, I guess they just want to, uh, you know, kind of control uh, the inclusion criteria, you know, who are, that we're treating appropriately and so forth. I think Dr. Mayank wanted Mayank wanted so, uh, Thank you, Dr. Muni, Dr. Ajoy, for sharing your experiences. I have to, a quick question on your thoughts on handling of the AAV vectors. Uh, any uh, by the hospital pharmacy, any recommended biosafety levels or uh, so? And another quick question on uh, any thoughts on percentage of cells that should actually show uh, gene integration cause a change in the vision or full. So, I mean, uh, any pharmacy that has experience with uh, clinic managing clinical trial drugs uh, can handle uh, AV vector. I mean, from a clinical pharmacy point, hospital pharmacy point of view. And uh, your second question is, you know, what percentage of retina need to be detached or what percentage of cells needs to be transduced to get any effect? So uh, uh, in the US where they have treated much more cases than we have uh, here in Canada, 
I hear that even in patients who have bare perception of light, uh, they try to give a uh, superotemporal injection with some improvement in light perception. So we have not reached that stage yet. It just tells that if there is any amount of viable retinal cells, uh, and if you inject 0.3 micro, um, 0.3 milliliters, uh, there is, uh, you know, there is some improvement. But if you look at uh, basic science studies for other gene therapies, they say that if you are able to rescue about 30 percentage of cells or transduce, transduce about 30 percentage of cells, you'll see rescue. So, but then in these clinical patients, we have no idea uh, what percentage of cells we end up treating. We just try to detach and see uh, if uh, it will lead to improvement. Yeah. Puna wants to ask a question. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Rajini ma'am, Dr. Ajay Vincent, and uh, Dr. Ajumani for an excellent presentation. To take this from Indian perspective, I know Lelux Turna to translate it will cost around 7 to 8 crores in Indian rupees. So, unless it's brought down to 1,000 stuff, I think many of the Indian patients are possible. What do you think the way forward? Example, if I start producing my own vectors, if India develops a plant where we start producing our own vectors, do you think that can bring down the cost in a significant way? What so, yeah. uh, uh, Spark, uh, when it actually uh, sold the company to Luxterna, there was an agreed price point. So that is where the uh, uh, pain point is at this time. So Novartis, I'm told, does not have much wiggle room reduce the cost itself. However, depending on the size of the market, they actually negotiate prices with the government. So what I hear, uh, what we hear is that uh, NHS or UK probably has the most competitive price for Luxterna because there is more patients for eligible treatment and uh, uh, no artist wants obviously uh, I think that if you have larger patients in India, and that is there will be, uh, it will be much more affordable compared to what the, it could be even half the price point. I'm assuming, I don't know for a fact um, uh, of what we get here. And also, as uh, my colleague Dr. Moon said, uh, you know, you only need 0.3 microliter or 0.3 ml, and you actually get 2 ml of the drug. So, you know, uh, you could actually plan to use it on multiple patients if the, you wouldn't get into insurance problems or problems. Would you line up and, and inject it? No, 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 my question, huh? my question, what about negotiate? I mean, for telling off, it about off, even if you make it one tenth of it. So, so to, uh, coming to your point, Dr. Purnachandra, uh, is that uh, the actual technology is not that expensive. So, uh, if you look at what Dr. Bhatt, uh, Rajni Bhattu is trying to do, uh, I stem, it is being pr produced far, uh, a far fraction of the cost than it is developed in the Western world. So, for sure, yes, it will be you know, as long as there is enough of uh, GCP and a clear certified labs, it is possible to develop at a fraction of. It. Thank you. One last question, Dr. Question. Gopal, and uh, is there the role of repeat injection? So, where would yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> that is a bone of contention, sir, uh, in the sense that you know, um, so if you look at clinical trial data, uh, up to 10 years, there is a uh, persistence of improvement in uh, uh, FST uh, and but and the maintenance of vision threshold and visual fields in the patients been treated already. So, uh, repeat injection have not been uh, approved uh, by FDA or Health Canada at this point. Uh, but that is something they have been trying to do in non-human non -human primates at this time, see if there is any. But at this time, uh, uh, that remains, to, that remains, uh, the question is open. Thank you, Joy. I'm going to have a last comment from Dr. Deepika and Dr. Dr. Santosh to come on the stage. Deepika is here. Uh, wants, she has a question. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have a to make from you know this is the doctor Vin look at like there's a clear message on when we have to in gene therapy get better results so the case two and three so we had better vision and also the photoreceptor ellipsoid zone was better maintained along with the outer, outer nuclear layer so they had the best visual improvement it is again showing that the earlier intervene so better results uh, we get so that is the clear message which is coming from this uh, issue I, I i had just one interesting point on fundus autofluorescence uh, which uh, dr vincent showed uh, recently like the other group had also published a long series of where fundus autofluorescence from no to a good autofluorescence in about six to eight years of follow-up so uh, do you have any idea on in this autofluorescence function will come post-op uh, visit like how many months post it will come so that uh, we can shift to you know autofluorescence from fst yeah so uh, very valid point so but then again the question is like uh, the health regulatory bodies will be allowed based on what phase three phase two phase three data is and real world data should actually drive it further to be able to treat patients earlier whilst you don't want to treat patients too early to cause harm now uh, to your second point you probably have to switch to quantitative fundus autofluorescence to actually demonstrate an improvement because what if you transduce enough vector and get enough uh, transduction then the idea is that a to e your lipofuscin will build up because there's some a vitamin A recycling that happens, but it will take a few months. Uh, we have not noticed it on uh, in a qualitative exam. Probably have to quantitative water flow. So it is shown, as you said, that it can improve for about. I think it will take about three to six months to see any. But that signal is so low, and that. Not all patients we are able to get good autoflow from the remaining area. That remains a challenge. But if that can be done, uh, it will can also be used as a, a surrogate marker uh, for maintain, you know, maintenance or risk. Thank you. Thank you. Ajoy and Dr. Rajiv, thank you so very much. Uh, I think we, we, we can discuss this for the next couple of hours, but you know we have to get going. So. Uh, thank you once again, and I'm going to invite Dr. Santosh Mahapatra for his talk on optogenesis. Good afternoon, and privileged to be part of this wonderful session. My uh, topic of presentation: upcoming field of optogenetics. I have no financial. So, optogenetics really deals with optics, genetics in combination. And it induces uh, and achieves achieved by genetic introduction of light proteins, maybe into the neuronal tissue or maybe into the eyes. And it is uh, uh, done through print optogenetic activators like channel rhodopsin, allorhodopsin, or arcurhodopsin. And they are derived from different, uh, these, these are microbial opsins and derived from either uh, algae, which is being activated in, in blue light, and the mechanism being selective polarization. Allorhodopsin is uh, derived from a bacteria, and uh, the way it activates uh, the pin is by hyperpolarization with conj conjugative silencing. And Arcurhodopsin, again derived from another bacteria, and it is activable in, in June. So, opsins represent uh, the major optogenetic tools. They are, uh, as discussed, can be microbial or animal opsins, which uh, is present in eukaryotes and binds to G protein coupler receptors and acts through the uh, 11 cis retinal configuration. The clinical applications include uh, in the field of psychiatry, where you can uh, use schizophrenia, OCD, narcolepsy, etc. The field of cardiology, where it is being used for defibrillation, arrhythmia, or pest. The field of neurogastroenterology for gastroparesis, IBS, 
functionality space etc and in the field of ophthalmology uh, which is most uh, vital for us because it can be used not only for a single disease but a group of disorders where uh, if there is rp disorders like congenital amaurosis or choreodermia or uh, photoreceptor disorders like retinitis pigmentosa Taggart's maculopathy amatosia, or in the retinal uh, disorders like x-linked retinal sclerosis retinitis pigmentosa being the most common uh, disease found in one in four thousand population worldwide and a cumulative number of one million people uh, suffering from rp uh, is the point of focus here uh, this uh, is is being uh, like uh, the most uh, potential source for application of optogenetics because it, it is uh, most common as i said and uh, the, a disorder where the photoreceptors are the targets and it is uh, caused by more than 100 different genetic mutations and 30 percent of the rp uh, patients don't have any specific mutation detected in them we have current uh, management options which includes retinal prosthesis which is need to be surgically implanted into the eyes and uh, has external camera and power source get it activated and has limitation of uh, being uh, with a small degree of visual field and damage the eye or the retina over time and needs external source of power. Medical treatments include the avoidance of light, low vision aid or high dose of vitamin A, but does not reverse RP. Thus limited uh, to help uh, to deal with the RP patients over a period of time. The stem cell therapy targets the photoreceptors or RP cell as uh, uh, was discussed in the first lecture and is, it, is a, it has a potential to become oncogenic. But uh, definitely gene therapy carries some hope for these patients but uh, it delivers normal genes into the uh, photoreceptor as just discussed uh, in case of Luxterna and uh, but we need to have photoreceptors or RP functional to get the benefit out of it. Hence, uh, we need to have different mechanisms to target when there is loss of RP or photoreceptor cells, as in case of advanced digits in retinitis pigmentosa. And there, the target cells are not photoreceptors, but uh, cells like bipolar cells or ganglion cells but uh, we have limitations as discussed where uh, you can have a, a technical difficulty for a b carried vectors or there can be a chance of potential immune response or there is restriction in expression of the subtypes or uh, it is it, it is difficult to be applicable in primates or have intensity of uh, uh, optogenic stimulation only in very high light intensity so to combat all these limitations, the mutation agnostic optogenic therapy for vision restoration has come into picture. And it can just be delivered into the eyes by just a simple intravitreal injection as uh, given for uh, any other injections in the eye. And the cell targets are either bipolar cells or ganglion cells. Bipolar cells are uh, preferred over ganglion cells because they are close to the photoreceptors and uh, they are larger in number as compared to ganglion cells. So they provide higher spatial and temporal resolution. So the history goes like uh, between 1970 to 90, there was discovery of opsins and gradually different uh, uh, carriers like uh, channel adoption, hollow adoption came into picture. And only in 2009, optogenetic therapy could, could be applied to primates and uh, it was uh, in 2016 and uh, end of 17 which was first applicable in humans. We conducted a pilot study uh, uh, under Nanoscope Therapeutics USA in our hospital between 2019 and 20 
and uh, uh, with these results, uh, the USA approved to, uh, to conduct the study in US, which is going on in six centers in US now. So these are the few public, uh, published data on optogenetics, how it works. I would like to show uh, this uh, small video uh, on this uh, mutically, uh, this mice, which is a genetically induced uh, blind mice, and it's not getting a, a erection, or get the light, but when they are injected, uh, can see uh, in any of the channels if the, the mice is being left getting away. So ambient light activable opsin, which is otherwise known as multi-characteristic opsin, has a very good potential because it can be activated in ambient light and no goggles is to be used uh, to stimulate and it, it provides uh, Temporal and spatial resolution. So, as uh, shown in the previous slide, this, these are the options and optogenetic therapy, genetically targeted, mutation independent, non invasive, has a stable expression, and it provides higher resolution both spatial and temporal, and not dependent on the degree of blindness and is activable in light. Hence, it has a very good potential to be uh, applied in clinical science times to come. So to summarize, optogenetics therapy holds considerable promise for restoring vision due to retinal degeneration for which there is no approved treatment and it focuses on disease phenotype instead of specific genotype. Therefore, it is a platform technology that has potential to be used in broad retinal degenerative diseases and it is activable in uh, ambient light. So with this, we can take uh, this study further and as I said, I am going to present the study in, uh, in the tomorrow uh, in the same power session. Thank you very much. Dr. Sun, thank you so much. Uh, we'll just hold on to the question. Is Dr. Nikita here? Please come. Santosh, we will carry questions, I think, in coffee. And uh, I'm going to request Nikita to come and present her talk. Good evening, everyone. The topic is multimodal imaging characteristics and genetic profile of erchromatopsia in North Indian cohort. Erchromatopsia is a rare inherited retinal disorder affecting the function of all three types of cone, with an incidence being 1 in 30,000 live births. Patients usually present in infancy or early childhood, parents usually complaining the child is unable to open eyes in bright light, that is hamarlopia or photophobia. Other clinical features are pendulum nystagmus or strabismus. The diagnosis is based on this typical history, clinical examination, which is an essentially unremarkable fundus in most patients, ERG findings, and genetic analysis. The six known genes implicated in erchromatopsia are CNGB3, which is the most common, followed by CNGA3, GNAT2, PDE6H, PDE6C, and the very recently ATF6. So, erchromatopsia is an underdiagnosed cause of childhood blindness. As, as there is positive literature regarding profile and genetics of erchromatopsia patients in India, we did a study with the aim to describe the profile of erchromatopsia patients in a North Indian cohort using multimodal imaging and genetic sequence. We did a retrospective analysis of 26 eyes of 13 genetically proven patients of erchromatopsia, and the diagnosis was based on correlation of presenting complaints, clinical examination, multimodal imaging, which included color fundus photograph, fundus autofluorescence, spectral domain OCT, field DRG wherever possible and genetic uh, testing, clinical exome sequencing followed by confirmation with Sanger sequencing. Coming to the results, regarding the genetic prof uh, demographic profile, uh, most of our patients hail from Punjab with the few patients from Haryana, Himachal Pradesh and U. 54% of our study population was Median age of presentation was 8 years which ranged from 33 months to 21 years and the median age at final diagnosis was 12 years which ranged between 4 years to 21 years. As we were initially unaware of this diagnosis, there was a longer interval between presentation and diagnosis initially. However, as we got more, uh, as we got smarter, we made a diagnosis pretty early. Coming to the presenting features, majority of our patients presented with hamarlopia, one-fourth of the cohort presented with nystagmus, and 15% all presented with strabismus. 
The best corrected visual acuity in half of our cohort was less than or equal to 6 by 60. Coming to the fundus changes, 50% of our study population had a normal looking fundus. However, rest 50% had either an altered foveal reflex or a foveal atrophy, as seen in this patient with the bronze beaten appearance of the fundus. Fundus autofluorescence changes were found in at least around 83% of our patients. As we can see, either 60% of them had a hyper autofluorescent ring at fovea with a hypofluorescent autofluorescent center, and 40% of uh, these patients had a hyper autofluorescence region, uh, region at the fovea. OCT changes were also pre present in majority of our patients, with 89% showing OCT changes, with either a disruption of the ellipsoid zone, uh, as seen in 27% of our patients, an absence of ellipsoid zone with a hyperreflective optically empty space, uh, seen in 39% of our patients, and 23% of our patients showed a complete photoreceptor layer loss with RP disruption. Such findings of disrupted ellipsoid zone were initially even missed by us, but later when we uh, got the genetic testing and we went back to the OCT, we did see there were changes in the OCT. This is a representative case of a 12-year-old male who presented with complaints of hamarlopia and photophobia with the best corrected visual acuity of 6 by 36 in both the eyes. The fundus examination was essentially normal and so we got an OCT and autofluorescence done to look for the cause of vision loss. And we saw that there was a hypo-autofluorescent region at the fovea with a hyper-autofluorescent ring and the OCT also showed corresponding changes with the disruption of ellipsoid zone in both the eyes. Even in the left eye, we can see that the, e, uh, the, uh, the external limiting membrane and the RP is intact, however, the ellipsoid zone is absent. Genetic testing revealed a CNG A3 positive mutation in the patient, making a diagnosis of achromatopsia. ERG was possible in uh, 8 of our patients, and all of them had diminished photopic responses with a near normal uh, rod responses. Genetic testing revealed 85% of our patients to have a CNG A3 mutation, and only 15% showed a CNG B3 mutation, which is contrary to the data. Uh, prevalent which shows more commonly CNG B3 mutation. An autosomal recessive inheritance pattern was found in our patients. Genetic mutation was homozygous in 6 patients, heterozygous in 4 and compound heterozygous in 3. The strength of our study was that it was a detailed uh, uh, multimodal imaging of all patients who were genetically proven for achromatopsia. This also gives the genetic data of a relatively underdiagnosed disease from an Indian population. However, it was a retrospective cross-sectional study with a uh, small sample size and a long-term follow-up of these patients is also essential to know whether, the, uh, whether achromatopsia is actually a stationary disease or a progressive disease. Uh, uh, coming to the therapeutic options, red tinted or dark tinted glasses help improve the quality of life in these patients as this child was quite photophobic uh, in uh, room light. However, in, uh, when we gave her red tinted glasses, she was quite comfortable and could even happily pose for a photo with the flash of the camera. Other therapeutic options are refractive error correction and gene therapy. Clinical trials uh, with animal studies in phase 2 have shown that uh, with the GNG A3 and B3 genes, there are even uh, uh, reversal of ERG changes. So to conclude, achromatopsia is an uh, important differential in young patients presenting with hemarlopia on a normal clinical examination. Fundus autofluorescence and SDOCT help uh, greatly in the diagnosis of achromatopsia. The literature is still divided whether achromatopsia is a stationary or progressive disease. And if uh, we can identify the patients who are, uh, these patients early, then we can actually uh, uh, find ideal candidates for gene therapy. I would like to thank Dr. Simha Rajan Singh for uh, all the hard work behind this study and giving me the opportunity to present this at this point. Much, uh, Anika, that is a very nice presentation. Thank, uh, thanks for the study. Actually, uh, one important finding which is coming out, which is known in achromatopsia, but maybe for the audience, what message we can give is that, you know, your study, 50% of the eyes had normal fundus. A young patient with decreased vision having hemorrhopia, normal fundus, we should always suspect achromatopsia, the message which is coming. And those cases, actually, your study results of multimodal, it is more applicable than when we see the norm, abnormal fundus. Sure. Any specific kind of OCT features you saw in the patients with normal fundus? Are they having stage 1, stage 2? Um, basically, yes, with, with normal fundus, we usually found a disruptive ellipsoid zone, which is really missable. We uh, did not look at, at it carefully, like we did, we missed it. But in retrospective analysis, we saw that there was subtle disruption of ellipsoid zone or some layer disruption in the outer retinal layers at the fore. That is what is in stage 1 necromata. One more question I was just interested about the ERG finding which you showed. Uh, usually, uh, this is what is seen in any condition where there is severe affection of the core. Okay, whenever there is severe affection of the photopic responses, you do see that in the rod responses, dark adapted 10 responses uh, will also be reduced. 
so i think it will not be completely normal they will be normal responses they will be abnormal with some reduction of happens in acromatopsia and any disease i think you had a point so in your erg findings you mentioned the photo what extent was it diminished uh, even the 30 hertz flicker response was diminished and the early uh, to what extent like compared to normal it was diminished to 60% percent of it haven't really quantified but yes it was diminished up to and like waves in were in acromatopsia most of the time it will be unrecordable because all three they forms. varied so basically they varied with the uh, with only patients with only subtle changes in fundus autofluorescence and they were less diminished and those with then, then that's not a case of acromatopsia to label it acromatopsia light adapt response most of the time it's unrecordable because you rightly mentioned all three forms of cone will be affected they can be incomplete acromatopsia where some cones are still uh, viable and still left so there those the genetic proof on all of them sir go ahead ajoy so i have a few questions and comments if i may uh, one is that uh, I see that uh, your personal patients have nystagmus. Uh, could you make a comment why it is playing a call? The second uh, is that if you have uh, patients who have incomplete acromatopsia, there can be some residual photopic ERG accurate, but then uh, in most cases, be severely reduced, and this would be gene, uh, uh, you know, uh, mutation dependent. Third thing is that uh, your comment about it is not yet clear whether acromatopsia is stationary or uh, progressive. I need to be modified because most patients who have seen GA3, B3, and PD6C uh, are probably stationary, but cases with, with ATF6 and PD6H are probably progressive. There is some literature which shows that. So, you are right in saying GA3 and B3, there are only a few cases that show progression, but for ATF6 and APD6H, I think, I believe there is enough data, PD6C, in fact, there is enough data to do. Now, now, you know, what you comment about why nystagmus low prevalence in your cohort? Uh, so probably I think uh, the reason is because we diagnosed because the patients who presented to us uh, maybe of, uh, at a later age because uh, nystagmus is known to improve with time in patients with acromatopsia. Uh, so we and we also diagnosed patients pretty late, not at the the first presentation. So that could be one reason. Uh, regarding uh, question, like second question was a comment regarding ERG. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. fine. And so that's I right. couldn't You're find right. any prospective study which uh, uh, showed that uh, uh, a longitudinal study of the same patient showing uh, chromatopsia as a progressive disease. I saw studies where they show that different patients at different age did have the age the uh, patients the older patients did have more uh, OCD changes, but it wasn't a longitudinal study. So I am not sure whether it is clear still whether it's progressive. So I think if you look at an article by Michaelis Georgiou, uh, uh, you know, published uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Tony Robson is also an author. Mike Michaelis is. You would see uh, that patients over time. It is retrospective data, but the same patient over time, um, there is clear indication that it will present sub genetic subtypes. Not all. You're right. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, We'll take a last question. In fact, if anybody has a question, Dr. Santosh, because we couldn't have any, any of, yeah. So, anyway, yeah. I think the last session, I'll take the liberty of extending. So, so uh, Dr. Santosh, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, I had a quick question around uh, one that, uh, do we know the approximate percentage of retinal cells, the bipolar or the ganglion cells, which undergo transduction after the uh, intravitreal injection? And uh, what is the time of the expression of the optogen? Last question is around uh, what the people approved had to seek to actually receive that. So the first question, second question, first because did uh, load the patient till 52 weeks, and uh, I think 16 week was the peak, and it is maintained till end of the study. Percentage you cannot uh, directly 
clicked. Uh, uh, we had a situation of um, uh, M cherry, just showing hyper uh, resistance, uh, but uh, humans you cannot do a immuno chemistry done in primates uh, so that you can uh, directly estimate the percentage there for humans it is basically not possible i wrap up the session thank you very very much and have a photograph yeah, i think we let's have a photo i have just one uh, announcement to make to the organizers the uh, inaugural ceremony is going to be held at the lawns outside not in this room at 6 p.m. Ajoy and Rajiv, no, I thought we'll have a picture with them in the back. That's what they do typically, sir. I thought we'll finish the picture and then that's what it's. Can we show them? Go ahead, man. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Muni, I had a question uh, regarding uh, the injection procedure. Uh, the first question was uh, when uh, the Spark Therapeutics conducted the trial for the Luxon, uh, they said that the supratemporal quadrant injected uh, and not to touch till the fovea. So, uh, what are the takes uh, from you on that, whether to touch to fovea to increase the sensitivity or whether to avoid the fovea, that's first part. Uh, second, uh, I would just like to make a comment regarding the what Dr. L.G. sir uh, said regarding the sensitivity of the perimetry. So, uh, five days, the whole lot of fluid gets absorbed. The sick RPE, it's still a challenge uh, to me. Uh, the other thing is that they, in the study, they mentioned 0.3 milliga uh, 3 ml only where we injected in two separate sessions at two separate sites. There was a huge lot, uh, there was a lot of fluid which injected subretinally. So any, any uh, comments on the sensitivity part on and the site with foveal involvement? But when we were trained to do the injections, um, uh, the uh, Albert McGuire uh, um, in had given us a, um, some information and basically when they tried to uh, inject early cases um, under the fovea, there were cases of a macular hole formation um, and uh, there's concerns also about atrophy and, and so forth. So the instruction was to inject it at the supratemporal arcade and have the fluid in the vicinity of the fovea, but not under the fovea. Uh, and then during the air fluid exchange, the fluid will migrate posteriorly. Uh, and that was thought to be acceptable that would migrated into the fovea uh, during the air fluid exchange procedure that that would be, re that would be acceptable. But under the pressure of the induction, uh, they did not recommend injecting under the fovea to create the blood there, let the blood migrate there on its own. And the other thing is we uh, kept the patient supine for 24 hours after. We know that when you have an air bubble, it will just get displaced to the periphery based on the head positioning. And so uh, by keeping them supine, it keeps the drug uh, there longer. Any uh, correlation with the perimetry? Loss of uh, sensitivity? So, uh, if I may take that part of the question. Uh, so, uh, to your point, like patients, uh, immediate post-op complaints uh, about some area where they can't see, which are presumably injection sites. Uh, if we, uh, we design uh, all these injections based on uh, what uh, experience uh, uh, Al McGuire or Thomas Element people have in various centers in the US. So there is a thought where there are some groups give the 0.3 ml at the supratemporal quadrant regardless of, of where the visual fields are. And there are actually give directly transduce the area where you want the vector to go primary. 
So the opinion on that is divided even among experts. Uh, we opted, especially in case one, where the only island that was very free, and the available literature showed that FST and which is and it made no sense to actually try to target these regions because otherwise uh, we may not even get any transduction in the far periphery. So a deliberate attempt was done to injection to actually target those areas. The only thing we try to do is directly avoid injecting in site where there is an atrophy or there is now uh, microperimetry is almost impossible to be done in these patients because they don't have that much retinal CT even in the center. So it is some of these patients also have nystagmus and it has it can be challenging. Uh, static perimetry can be done to your point to actually try uh, to see what actually you know to get retinal sensitivity thresholds area, but children it is a bit challenging. So, um, but it is possible. So, static perimetry has to be done uh, in patients who are a bit older, where you can reliably get fields, and patients have the you know are capable and have the patients. Thank you. Any functionality? Last one. Last one. Just yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Any any functionality test uh, that you guys uh, did uh, pre-operatively and post-operatively? Like doctor shared the experience that the knife fell down and she was able to recognize and pick it up. I guess in this PARC trial, uh, the Luxana trial, they had one test in the dark room, MLMT, yes. A any, any similarity to any MLMT test that uh, we did so, to yeah. compare? So, so the MLMT test is almost uh, impossible in the real world setting because you like a huge setup. So the full field sensitivity test, which was a secondary outcome measure in the SPARC trial, the improvements that were seen in MLMT was also mirrored in full field stimulus. So FST is used as a surrogate marker in real world experience. So FST is your best bet. It is very easy to perform. It is reproduced and it can mirror MLMT or multi test. Thank you, Ajay. I think Dr. Gopal has a question. Last question, I think. I don't want to extend the discussion. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you that is there a distinct effect expected apart from the site of injection? Is that the reason why you are getting FST uh, showing a good response despite fields not having improved? Is there any distinct effect also seen? So, uh, you know, I think even in the area where the peripheral fields are present, if they are retained but the cells are transduced, uh, there is increased retinal sensitivity. So you just need a small area sensitive uh, uh, where the visual cycle is to actually get uh, an improved retinal sensitivity because you a diffuse flash, the patient can see it anywhere where the retina is sensitive to actually get an effect. So it need not necessarily get the actual site, but we actually try to target the third sites based on. Thank, Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Rajiv. Just stay there. Your guys are in the background. We're going to get a picture of all of us, so just stay there. Ajoy and Rajiv, 
Thank you very, very much. This was a wonderful session. Like I said, we could have probably gone on for another two hours discussing this, but time is always a limiting factor. So, thank you so much, thank guys, you. for you know uh, uh, coming up this early in the morning. And uh, thank you. See you soon. Have a wonderful day, guys. Enjoy and Rajiv. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank Bye. you.